Jeremiah chapter 8 verse uh, 4 is where we're going to focus today. I'm preaching to you something that the Lord gave me back in August of last year. And he, he, he instructed me to preach this, to teach this on Father's Day of this year. And so I've been holding this thing in, in my belly for, for a, a while now, marinating in, in me. And so I, I'm very passionate about this message. I want to preach to you to the, for the next few minutes this thought, when you fall. When you fall. Holy Spirit, I just ask you in this moment to do what only you can do. I know that you promise that your word has an assignment attached to it and it cannot return to you voided but must accomplish that in which you send it to do. Today, on this Father's Day in 2022, I ask you, Holy Spirit, to release this word with a mission that it will strike the heart and the cord that needs to be struck and forever be changed by the power of the life that is in your book. We love you today. We thank you for your word. We acknowledge it now in Jesus' name. Amen. When you fall, when you fall, falling is a very interesting thing. Many of us understand the context of falling. We fall in love. We fall in love. If we've had our heart broken in some way, we fall to pieces. Not only do we fall to th- pieces, but sometimes when relationships kind of break down, we, tell, we say things like things have fallen apart. But many of us, literally, uh, I can speak testimony to this, we fall down the stairs. Okay? Um, for those of us who don't have a mama who puts us in a bubble, we fall off of our bicycle when we're learning how to ride a bike. And many of us um, uh, even recognize that we have season, a season every year, not just winter, not just spring, not just summer, but we also have a season every year that we call the fall. It is a very natural thing to deal with a fall. Whether we're falling in love or we're dealing with the fall season of life, it is a very natural thing to deal with fall. Not only is it a natural thing, but it is also a spiritual thing. The Bible tells us in the book of Genesis that when Adam sinned against God's purpose, when he was disobedient, they call that the fall of humanity, the fall of Adam. In the book of Revelation, we find out that right before Jesus is to return and gather all of us up, that there is going to be a great falling away of people from their faith. Falling is not only a natural thing, falling is also a spiritual thing, and falling seems to be common among both of them. The warning that Solomon gives us in the book of Proverbs chapter 16 verse 18 is that you and I must guard our pride because pride comes before destruction, watch this, and a haughty spirit before a fall. I didn't have time in the first service, but I, I, Em and I and the family, we, we went away, went to Florida for, for um, a few days last week, and we were on vacation for a while, and one particular beach that we went to, um, we went to, uh, what was it, St. Augustine, where the preacher was? Fort Myers, it was, Fort, it was one of them hell places, hallelujah. Anybody hate the beach as much as me? Does anybody hate the beach as much as me? Every man, happy Father's Day. I hate the beach. Hate it. Why in the world do I want to sit out there and get burned and sweat to death? And then look at people in skimpy bathing suits that have no business being that comfortable with their own skin. We're sitting there. Come on, y'all. I they asked me, they said, oh, God, help me, Jesus. They asked me, they said, PG, are you going out there to go to the I said, listen, I'm going to wear my da dun da Some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about. But they were real tight speedos, go da dun da you know, my da dun da I'm rocking my da dun da I hope y'all don't ever come around. da dun da Never mind. So, we're sitting there, we're at the beach, and I'm sweating to death. Out, and I'm just, just a reminder, I ain't going to hell for nobody. I ain't going to hell for nobody. So I'm just not going to hell for nobody. It's just too hot in the beach. I can't imagine what fiery torment is going to be like. And we're sitting there and, and we're doing our thing. All of a sudden, um, the, these, these two um, evangelists come by and they've got their own speaker. And, and one of them has got, you know, 
turn to Jesus or burn in hell shirt. And the other one that says get right or get left or something to that effect. I mean, it's, I, I call that confrontational evangelism. Okay, and, and I'm throwing no shade. I appreciate the radicalness with, I mean, everybody else puts it on blast. There's got to be somebody. It was confrontational. He, listen, y'all, I know y'all think I'm, I'm a little bit bold with some of the things I say. They embarrassed me with some of the things they were saying. I'm sitting there going, oh, my God. Lord Jesus, I can't believe he said that in a sermon. They embarrassed me with some of the things they were talking about. And I mean, it was confrontation upon confrontation. As they were coming up, it was amazing to me, our culture. As they were coming up, all of a sudden, the DJ behind us jacks up the music. And he played three songs as a soundtrack to this particular moment. Interesting. They're preaching about Jesus. They're preaching about eternal life in him and in him alone. Yes, at the beach as a captive audience. Okay, they're doing all that. They're having this confrontational evangelism thing. And listen, um, somebody said, what, isn't that just ridiculous? And I'm like, no, it's not ridiculous. I watched four people walk up and ask for salvation tracks. I ain't saying nothing. It may not be my thing, but I mean, you know, hey, praise God. What, but they may have been drunk. Well, praise the Lord. God saves drunk people. Come on. The Holy Ghost will make you. Never mind. He shut up. <laughs> what was amazing to me is as soon as they got close to where we were, the DJ behind us started jacking the music. Listen to the three songs the DJ played while they were preaching the gospel. Running with the devil. Running with the devil. Okay. After that song was done, he immediately went into Devil Went Down to Georgia. Now I thought, what kind of dummy? We're in Florida. <laughs> talking about the... That's, see, that's how stupid the devil will make you. <laughs> Running with the devil, Devil Went Down to Georgia, and then he, he finished it off while they were going through with Highway to Hell. Okay. He thought he was being funny. What he didn't realize, he was being a tool. Okay? He was being a tool. And it's amazing. This thought came to my mind while we were watching. I'm watching confrontational evangelism take place, and I'm watching a soundtrack that is contrary to everything that, of the life that they're trying to give in Jesus Christ. And I, and th I wrote this down. It, it, here's what the Lord said to me. He said, salt life is no longer affiliated with believers but beachgoers. At what point are you and I going to become the salt and the light? The sun was beaming and it created a sunburn, but it was very dark in that moment. And here, we, we now see it all over stickers on the back of people's cars. They call it salt life. Well, that's not Christianity anymore. That's now beach attenders. I can't wait to get back to the beach versus being a believer again. There's something about a haughty spirit that will lead you to falling. But he doesn't leave it that way. He leaves us in the Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16, that watch this. A righteous man may fall seven times. It's not so much that you failed seven times as much as the fact that you were willing to get up eight. A righteous person may fall seven times but rises again, but the wicked will fall by calamity. In other words, to live righteously does not mean you're never going to fall. It's a natural process, it is a spiritual process, and now scripture tells us that it's not a matter of a salvation issue, righteous people fall too. One of the challenges of having days like today as we honor our fathers and back in May when we honored our mothers is many of us under the sound of my voice, it is no problem for you to celebrate on Father's Day. But there are just as many people under the sound of my voice that have a very difficult day on Father's Day because of the fall that is represented by that person on this day. But what I love about this particular text is just because you fall doesn't mean you have to stay. Because here it is. The failure of your past does not mean you are chained and your future has to remain that way too. Your future is not chained by the failure of your past. And here we are in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 8. And, and let me paint the picture of what's happening for the weeping prophet Jeremiah. What, what's happening in the culture of this day 
is there's this overabundance of, of rebellion and hatred and sinfulness as it relates to this day that we're in Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 3. Look at this. It says that then death shall be chosen rather than life by all of the residue of those who remain of this evil family who remain in all the places where I have driven them. Here's what Jeremiah is saying on behalf of God, that there is coming a day, that there was a day that Jeremiah was living in, that it was more celebrated for death than life. That there was this abundance, full context of this statement. What was happening is the, the, the people of this day were taking their sons and daughters and they were sacrificing them on an altar and killing them in, in, in honor and representation of the sin God. Sin, S-I-N God, not sin, sin. But it was a, a solar deity. It was a de deity based upon astronomy and astrology. It was a, a God called sin that was an astrologistic type of deity. And they would, watch this, they would sacrifice their sons and they would sacrifice their daughters. Let me say it another way. They would abort their sons, they would abort the lives of their daughters, and they would celebrate those deaths much greater than they would celebrate those lives. Does it sound familiar today? And here's the weeping prophet. In a day where we celebrate death, more than life. And he says, look at this. Moreover, you shall say to them, thus says the Lord, will they fall and not rise? Will one turn away and not return? Verse 5. Why has this people slidden back Jerusalem in a perpetual backsliding? For those of you that come out of a doctrine that says there's no such thing as backsliding, I'm giving you scripture. Not my words. Here's the book of Jeremiah. In a perpetual backsliding, look at this, they hold fast to deceit. They refuse to return. I listened and heard, but they do not speak aright. No man repented of his wickedness, saying, what have I done? What did I do wrong? What have I done? Everyone turned to his own course as the horse rushes into battle. Did you know that you can so condition your horses for battle that every time they would hear the war drum, they would get antsy and excited and begin to rush towards it? This is what he's saying. Even the stork in the heavens knows her appointed time. And the turtle dove, the swift, and the swallow, the, the swallow, the, observe the time of their coming. But my people do not know the judgment of the Lord. My people don't even know about my judgment. How can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? Look. The false pen of the scribes certainly works falsehood. Verse 9, the wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord. So what wisdom do they have? What wisdom are you using if you're rejecting the word of the Lord? The power of this text it's found in verse 4. Will they fall and not rise? I just want to make five observations as it relates to falling. Number one, it's not a matter of if you fall, it's a matter of when you fall. There's no one perfect. There's no one able to have an entirely perfect day. It's not a matter of if you fall. The question is when are you and I gonna fall? Now, there's a difference between falling and sinning. Because sinning is the willful act of disobedience contrary to what God is saying about that situation and you choose contrary. That's sin. For him to know it to do good and do it and not, to him, it is sin. We're not talking about just sinning. We're talking about falling. Most often, we fall because we start tripping. We start tripping and then we fall. We're not talking about sin yet. 
The problem is when you fall, most often we fall into sin. But we didn't fall because of sin. We fell because we started tripping. We started tripping thinking it was by us that we were saved. We started tripping thinking that it was our religiosity and the fact we went to church and we got all of our disciplines correct. We start tripping. But the only reason you are saved is we're saved by grace through faith. That's the only reason we're saved. It is what he provided for us and that we have received, not we've done for ourselves. Not a matter of if, but a matter of when. Number two, falling humbles us. This is why he allows us to fall, because it keeps us humble. Because then you realize, wait a minute, I'm not so super Christian as I thought I was. I, I'm not so holy that I can't fall. I remember early on in, in our church, I was, I, was, I was dealing with one particular issue, and it was an issue of adultery. And, and I was having to, to I, I, I brought one of, the, one of the close guys in my relation in, in the church at that time with me and we, we went to one of our brothers and we're like, listen, this is not okay. So just in case y'all wondering, if I find out, I'm coming to see you. And here's the conversation. You tell her, before I tell her. So I brought one of my brothers with me. And I'm like, here, we're going to have this conversation. We're going to do, you know, go to, you know, you who are spiritual. We're going to restore. We're going to do whatever we need to do. Praise be unto God. We go there. After that conversation is over with, I look at the brother that was with me. And I'm like, man, that's a very tough situation. I, you know, li listen, before we leave, let's just you and I pray. Because everybody's susceptible to falling. There is not one person in this room that gets to lay their head down any day and go, thank you, Lord, you helped me to be perfect all day today. Okay? I'm helping you. They ain't nobody in this room can glow in the dark. And I said, let's you and I pray. He made this statement to me. He said, I don't need to pray about that. He said, I will never do that. Four years later, I'm having to stand in front of him and have the very conversation because a haughty spirit comes before a fall. And falling requires humility if you're going to get back up. Well, if she hadn't have, it, it, you ain't humble. Well, the reason that, mm -mm, you ain't humble. If that person had not of, now, now you are deflecting. It's humble. It humbles us. Number two, number three, falling guts us of our pride. If it's ever going to be reconciled, You have to not swallow it, surrender it. I ain't too proud to beg. We're not talking about begging. We're talking about you getting back up again. And I don't know why I feel this prompted of the Holy Spirit, but since I'm in this room, let me just feel this and, I, and just operate in this obedience. You will not fix y'all until you allow Holy Spirit to fix you. I'm just telling you, I'm telling you, you got to allow him to deal with you and stop looking, asking him to deal with y'all. Now, for those of you from the north, y'all means you guys. Okay? Heavy subject, I needed to crack a joke. But it guts us of our pride. It guts us of our pride. When it's you that's blown it, you, we... Most of the time, we react one of two ways. My bad. Mm, that's me. That's on me. It's all on me. Or we treat the person, mm, we treat the person like they have special needs. Okay? You ready? We, we treat them like they don't speak our language or they don't have ears that work. So we get louder 
and we talk to them like they cannot process our words. Versus just going, that's me. It's all on me. It guts us of our pride. Number four, falling helps us to be dependent upon God to move forward. I've seen God restore some incredible things. But I have also seen people get in the way of restoration. Because they're more bent on being right than righteous. Oh, the Holy Spirit is just taking this in a completely different way to the, in this service. You can be right or you can be righteous. One of them is a representation of God. It, I have to be, let me help you. God built you to be dependent upon him. You and I cannot do anything for God without God. I cannot be the husband he's called me to be if I don't have him in my life. I cannot be the father he's called me to be if I don't have him in my life. I cannot be the pastor, the leader, the Christian, the man. I cannot be anything he's created. My identity is in shambles if my relationship with the one who created me is in shambles. He built me to be dependent if I'm going to move forward. And then number five. Falling teaches us what not to do. Now, now, I know this is very difficult for those of us who like to put our children in bubbles. Okay? They got a helmet. They got knee pads. They got elbow pads. They got, they got you, know, you saran wrap them all around, around with the little bubbles everywhere. And, they, and then you put them on a bicycle with five tires and go, oh, baby, please don't fall. Please don't fall. They got five tires. If they fall, they probably don't... They probably need the helmet. That's right. Got five. Hey, hey, who my baby? And you're holding on the whole time. They got five times. Listen, I would rather my child fall and scuff his knee on his bike than understand what falling is behind a, 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 a car. Because sometimes falling teaches us what not to do. Now, I know y'all probably don't do this anymore because this is probably child abuse, but back in my day, my mama would let me get close to a hot stove. She let me get close to it. Don't you put your hand on that. 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 Don't you put your hand on one, two. Don't you put your hand on that. Most of us are, oh, baby. We scoop them up and we never let them know what a burn feels like. So when they go through the fire, their whole life is in shambles because maybe we should have let them touch the fire so they realize they probably shouldn't touch that ever again. You, you hear what I'm saying? I just want to protect my baby. I just want to keep my baby safe. Okay, fine. Keep your, protect your baby. Keep your baby safe. The problem may be that they live their entire life believing they never do anything wrong, and when they get locked up, they're shocked. Do you see what I'm saying? Because falling is a part of life. Yeah. Well, I'm not a good parent if I let them fall. Maybe you're a great parent because you let them fall early because you were their safeguard. Yeah. That's good. That's good. That's good. And if you fall off your bike, it is much different than manslaughter with your car. That's good. Yeah. It teaches us what not to do. There are some things you can't do when you're married. I don't, I'm beating this drum today. There's some things you can't look at when you're married. There's some things that you cannot entertain in your mind when you're married. Be, be, you don't hear what I'm saying. Because it's required to keep the marriage on the level it's supposed to be. Not because I have to. Well, partly because I have to because she'll kill me. And I don't mean metaphorically, I don't mean, you know, I mean literally. Take out a knife, you know, okay? But after 25 years of putting up with this, I get to stay married. Like, when, we, when, we, I, when I flash back and think for better or for worse, she got the raw end of this deal. She should have stopped the preacher right there and went, how much worse?
Y'all didn't have to laugh near as hard as you did. I just took her to Florida. She ain't got it all bad. And I sweat, you know, my God. So it's not a matter of when will you fall, but when you fall. Look, look at Solomon in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Look at verse 10. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls. It is a dangerous thing for you when you fall and ain't got nobody with you. There's no sister you can call. There's no brother you can call. It is a dangerous thing for them to fall in solitary confinement. We're going to fall, but we don't have to do it in isolation. In, in, a, few, in a few weeks, I think it's in October, I'm going to preach on homelessness. And it is amazing to me how many people, what people will do to keep from living on the streets physically, but have no problem being church homeless. You will beg, steal, borrow, do anything to keep yourself from being homeless in the natural. But it's amazing how church homeless people, how church homeless homeless people can be. It is a dangerous thing to fall by yourself. It is a dangerous thing for your marriage to fall and your marriage is by itself. Woe to you, Scripture says, for he has no one to help him up. The one who is in trouble is the one who is alone when they fall. The greatest picture of this, and I'm going to run to the end. We find it in the book of Luke, chapter number 22. Jesus is talking, and Peter is up there, and Peter's doing all this, this posturing with his words and, you know, talking about all this stuff. And, 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 and Jesus, he, he's already changed his name. Peter, you're no longer Simon, you're now Peter. Upon this rock, I'll build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail, Peter. And then Peter starts putting his proverbial foot in his mouth, and God, Jesus looks at him and goes, Simon, Simon. <laughs> you know you're in trouble. When Jesus changes your name and then calls you by who you used to be. Right. Simon, Simon. Right, right. <laughs> Two times. Simon, Simon. Look at what Jesus says. Satan has come to sift you as we. Do you know what it means to be sifted? Watch this. To be disconnected from your life source and then fall. Simon, Simon, the enemy has come to disconnect you from your source and make you fall. The reason the enemy has come to your situation is because he wants to disconnect you from your source and make you fall. But look at what Jesus says. But good news, Peter, I have prayed for you. Can you imagine Hearing the words, Jesus is praying for you. Yeah. It's one thing for mama to pray for you, for daddy to pray for you, for grandma to pray for you, to grandpa to pray for you, for the preacher to pray for you, for the intercessory prayer team to pray for you. But Jesus is praying for you. Listen to me. Jesus, even today, is praying for you. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 34, one, 34, that he is seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 that he lives to intercede for me and you. I need you to understand today why you're on the brink of falling. Maybe you're in a fallen state. Jesus is praying for you. 
What a prayer warrior you have when you know Jesus is praying for you. It's one thing to lead you, it's another thing to guide you, but to know that Jesus is praying for me. Jesus is praying for me here. Jesus is praying for me in that season. Jesus is praying for you. I have prayed for you. Listen to the prayer of Jesus. Look, that your faith I'm not praying that you won't fall, but I'm praying that your faith won't. I'm praying that when you fall, because you need to be humbled, you need to be gutted of your pride, you need to understand you're dependent upon me, I'm not praying that you won't fall. I'm praying that when you do fall, your faith doesn't fall with you. I'm here today to tell you that you're going to be all right as long as you don't let your faith fall. You can't let your faith fall, even if you're tripping, even if you're stumbling. Don't let your faith fall. Because falling is not final unless your faith goes with you. But I prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Watch this. And when you return to me. Oh, listen to the prophecy of Jesus. When you return to me. When you return to me, when you finally get off your hips and come back to the one it's really all about. When you, Jesus is prophesying, yes, you're going to fall. Yes, you're going to be sifted like wheat, but you're going to return to me. It is, your falling is not final. This failure is not final. You're going to return to me. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Train up the child in the way they should go. And when they're old, they will, they'll have to return to me. The power of this statement. is who you return to is determined by who you went to first. If you didn't go to Jesus first, then you may not return to him because you never went to him the first time. You might have went to church. You might have you might, you might went to you know, your, your family theology, the doctrinal denominational belief of your choice of your family. But if you've ever been to Jesus, even if you fall, you can come back again. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. You get to come back again. You get to return back to him. It is not so final. It doesn't matter how big the fall is. It is not so final that you don't have the opportunity to return back to him. And when you return to me, I love this statement. Strengthen your brethren. Oh my God. In other words, the mess that got me back to Jesus, he's going to use to be a message to my brothers that are in the same mess. The test I went through, The hell I went through, the drama I went through, the heartbreak I went through is all not final in my life. I'm going to return to Jesus. And when I come out of this because he's leading me out, I'm going to make somebody else stronger. I'm going to help somebody else get up because of what I've been through. Because if he'll do it for me, he'll do it for them. In other words, God's going to use your fall to prop somebody else back up. Oh, God, you didn't hear me. He's going to use your fall to prop somebody else back up. Your weakness is going to become strength for somebody else. But listen, you can't do this in a church full of perfect fakes. Has somebody sent a message 
over the past couple of weeks. Good church, but, but they want everything to be pretty because they won't deal with the tough issues. They won't, let, they won't love you through the tough issues. I'm sitting there going, you don't have a clue what you're talking about. I'm not going to let that slide. I'm, I'm going to do work. I'm going to show him. If he's willing to get back up, I'm willing to strengthen him. We're willing to strengthen him. He said in the book of Jeremiah that the children of Israel, God's people, were in a perpetual state of backsliding. Now, you, you have to understand what backsliding is, and I'm done here. Backsliding is not the turning away from God and running in, in a rebellious, prodigal way. That's not backsliding. That's called sinning. Backsliding is it, it, a term based upon what's happening in the life of a donkey. The, the picture of backsliding is that there is a man who has a donkey. A donkey is called a beast of burdens. In other words, the burden that the beast exists to hold the baggage so that it can be led by its owner. Okay, well a donkey is standing up and little by little they're putting the baggage on the donkey. And then they're tying the baggage to the donkey. And then it gets a rope put in the hands of the master and it's being led. But if you ever met a donkey, I'm, so, I'm trying my best to behave. They're stubborn by nature. They, they will only submit to a point. And then they get stubborn. So what they do is they say, you can hold the rope, but I'm not going any further. They stop. And then they sit back on their haunches. They didn't turn buck off and run in the opposite. That's not backsliding. They stop being led and decide to sit where they are. Watch this. The burdens were tied to their back while the donkey was standing. So the ropes were only conditioned while the donkey standing. When the donkey sits, it changes its point of view. And all of the burdens slide off of the back of the donkey who now refuses to move. That's why they call it backsliding. Many of us are backslidden Not because you ran back to all that stuff, but because you decided it's much easier to just sit right here. I'm not going any further. I'm going to sit. Oh, man, I don't have all that stuff on me anymore. I'm just going to stay right here. Listen, backsliding is not returning to your sin. Backsliding is refusing to follow the master who's leading you. And there are way too many of us in the church that are backslidden and think just because we didn't pick up the bottle, we're still being led. No, if you're squatting where you should have been walking out of, because you don't like, you like not having the load, the burden on you anymore. Today, Jeremiah goes a little further on. He says that God is about to heal you. 
from your backslidden state. Today, I believe that the healer is in this room to get you back up being led by him again. I, I leave my house about 5.30. And about 5, 5.45, I get to the second place that I believe the hand of God is on. On Sunday, since Chick-fil-A is closed, I believe he moves his favor to Bojangles. Okay, I just do. I mean, I just do, just do. About 5.45 every Sunday morning, you can find me at Bojangles. For those of you who are multi bilingual, you know, lingual. okay? Thank you. Gracias, gracias, gracias. Almost every Sunday morning. So they've gotten used to seeing me. The distance between Bojangles is just enough for me to eat my biscuit before I get my Starbucks. Okay, I map this thing out. Okay. So, so they've gotten used to me there. And, and this one particular lady, she's the cook. And let me just say, I never want to eat somebody's food who is skinnier than me. If you a skinny cook, you can't cook. And all God's children said, like, I want to know you know what lard is. You know what I'm saying? What I'm saying? I need a Crisco anointing. Hallelujah. So I pull in, and this, this precious lady, I, listen, I'm working on her. She don't know it, but I'm just being salt. I'm just being salt. So yesterday, we, we celebrated Father's Day yesterday, and um, we went out on the boat for, for a few hours. And um, I still have my boat attached to my truck. And so I'm making it through the drive through with my boat on the back. It works. God works in mysterious ways. He doesn't want us to perform. The hand of the Lord was on me. He guided me. He leadeth me. So I go through and I get what I always get from Bojangles. And, and I get to the, to the front and she's like, oh, pastor. Ready for a good day? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, happy Father's Day. I said, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. She looked. She said, oh, you got your boat on the back. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, you going fishing? And as soon as she said that, the Holy Spirit leaped in my belly and said, son, you're going fishing today. And I said, yes, ma'am. But it don't have nothing to do with that boat. The hand of the Lord spoke to me and said, today, I'm going to heal some people from backsliding. And I've come fishing this morning that the hand of the Lord would heal you from sitting stuck on your haunches because the burden is lighter if you're not moving. Oh, that you would heal them from backsliding. Listen to me today. The same God who can open blinded eyes. The same God who can unlock deaf ears. The same God who can raise people out of a tomb and bring them out. The same God that can take lepers and make them clean again. The same God that can shift all types of things is the same healing God that can heal you from being stuck right where you are. I'm fishing for you this morning that God would have opened and awakened on the inside of you the need for you to rise. Listen, you're not done just because you fell. You're not done just because you got sifted like wheat. You're not done just because things are difficult. But God is in this place to pull righteous people back up and following after him again. And I'm here today to go fishing to say, God is about to bring you back from backsliding. Stand with me all over this room this morning. Pastor, I'm not sure he can do it for me. Watch this. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so in this house today.
every person that has ever been brought back by God, give him worship all over this room. And if he will do it for them, you are not so far gone that grace cannot reach. Your sin is not bigger than the blood. Your pain is not so great that the grace of God cannot overwhelm it and turn it into goodness and mercy. Heads about, eyes are closed. Prayer team, move. Heads about, eyes are closed. I believe God wants to heal somebody in this room this morning. Pastor, you mean blinded eyes? No, I mean backsliding. You've stopped and you're stuck. Today, God is about to heal. God is about to heal. God is about to heal. Sweep this room, Holy Spirit. Speak to every son. Speak to every daughter. I'm calling you off your haunches today. The hand of God is lovingly nudging the bridle of your mouth today. You have rescued my life. You have rescued my life. I'm never. My response. my response, my response, response hallelujah. from God today's the day of salvation choose you this day who you'll serve return to me and I will return to you says the Lord or maybe today you're that backslidden donkey who has just decided I'm going to be stuck right here doesn't matter which one you may feel you are today. There is sufficient grace that will overwhelm what's been overwhelming you. If you're in this room this morning, watch it online, listen to the radio. 
you're here today and you say, PG, Pastor, God is dealing with me. The Holy Spirit has arrested my heart and I have to make a move. Hear me. It's going to require you to be gutted of your pride. He exalts the humble, but he brings low the proud. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You know if you're stuck. You know if you're sitting. And God's trying to nudge you and leading you. But you refuse to move. Today, God is going to heal that. I'm asking you to get out of your seat and meet me in this front for a closing prayer with our prayer team today. Come on, I release you right now. My eyes are closed. I just want the Holy Spirit to move in your heart. Sing, Vince. Come on, come on. Be gutted of your pride today. If you're a prayer warrior, you're a worshiper. And this message is not for you in this moment. Just worship. Just worship. Say.